There were Nephilim on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and bare children to them. The same were the mighty men of old, the men of renown. Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 7 are some of the most enigmatic verses in the Old Testament. What do these verses refer to? Was there actually giants living on the earth at the time before the Great Flood? This period is often called the Antediluvian period. Ante means before and Diluvian means deluge or flood. Many early Jewish writings and other ancient texts expound upon these verses. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, implies they are related to the Greek gods. Josephus and the Book of Antiquities Many angels of God now consorted with women, and begot sons who were overbearing and disdainful of every virtue. Such confidence had they in their strength. In fact, the deeds tradition ascribed to them recalled the audacious exploits told by the Greeks of the giants. But Noah urged them to adopt a better frame of mind and change their ways. The Book of Antiquities, Chapter 3 When people began to multiply, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Genesis 6, 1 Do angels have sex? The text tells us that the angels, they're called the sons of God, mate with human women and produce a race of giants as their offspring. Now, the story uh, seems to represent this as something that displeases God. God doesn't like the idea of this, this mixing between the angelic realm and the earthly realm. By the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them, but the sons uh, of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair. In other words, we have here the sons of God, B'nai Elohim, uh, the, the angelic cre creatures of God, looked down on earth women and lusted after them. They took wives of all whom they chose, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And the next sentence there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men. Those would be the titans of old, the, the uh, Olympians, the, the Greek and Roman giants of mythology, except uh, the Jews never believed those were mythological creatures. Josephus said that the titans were one and the same as these mighty men mentioned in Genesis. Because we're taking the message right from the Word of God. Right. And Genesis 6 is just one passage that talks about the angels. The book of Jude, of course, talks about the fallen angels. It talks about angels who kept not their first estate, but were kept in chains for the last day. So there's a, there's a dark story here, and, and what you've just told us right out of Genesis 6 is that these angels left their first estate in heaven, they obviously had a free will, and they came to earth and procreated with human women who they lusted after, who they found attractive. Uh, if you go into the ancient book of Enoch, uh, it says, and of course Enoch is not gospel and not the canon of scripture, but in the book of Enoch, which a lot of old time historians valued greatly, uh, it says clearly that these angels looked upon the women and their long hair, and they found that very attractive. And of course, you read the writings of Paul uh, later in the Gospels, where he talks about women hiding their hair, you know, putting their hair up. Absolutely, and there is a spiritual component to all this, uh, and that spiritual component has to do with the fall and with sin. <clears throat> there was a fall in heaven, uh, as well as a fall on earth, and that fall produced a race of uh, giants called the fallen ones, the Nephilim. That's who we're talking about, which comes from the Hebrew uh, verb nafal, which means to fall. In fact, nafal gives us our English word fall, just as a, a little uh, side issue there. But the, the Bible says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. The flood of the Bible and the flood of the Greek myth are remarkably similar. 
Is it possible a core of truth existed in the Greek myths? Were the Greek gods actually the Nephilim? Nephilim is the Hebrew expression for the fallen giants. Were the fathers of the Titans and the Olympians the fallen angels, called the sons of God in Genesis 6? The ancient Greeks believed in a flood that destroyed all mankind, similar to the account in the Bible. In the Greek myth, the flood took place during the age of Deucalion. Deucalion and his wife Pera were warned in advance of a coming flood and told to construct a chest and fill it with provisions. The source of the coming flood was the anger of Zeus towards mankind. Zeus had become disgusted at the degeneration of humans and in particular the practice of human sacrifice. Zeus assembled the gods and decided to destroy mankind by water. Deucalion and Pera survived the flood by floating in the chest they built. There are differences between the Greek myth and the account in the Bible. However, both maintain the world was destroyed as a result of mankind's sin and the human race was saved as a result of a few individuals leading a righteous life. Every culture around the world has a flood story. Many of these stories refer to giants before the flood just as the Greeks referred to their gods, the Titans and the Olympians. Many scholars are making the association of these Greek gods with the Nephilim and the fallen angels from the Genesis account. And just like the flood, many cultures around the world have legends of the star people, the ones who came down from heaven. I am convinced the star people are the fallen angels, the sons of God. If you study Greek classic Greek mythology, you run into the titans. These, these creatures in, their myth, in the legends and the myth, myths were partly terrestrial and partly celestial. They rebelled against their father Uranus and after a prolonged contest were defeated by Zeus and condemned where? Into Tartarus. Do you see a parallel brewing here? I'm going to suggest to you that the legends of the ancient Greeks embody the truth of what really happened in the past, that there were these strange creatures generating hybrids that the Greek called titans. And we see Zeus in many forms. We see, we see uh, Atlas and Hercules. Atlas and Hercules from, from Greek mythology were what would be called in the Hebrew Nephilim, offspring of an intermarriage between a god and a woman. And uh, so, now these legends, we, we obviously we see in the Sumer culture, in Assyria, in Egypt, I'll show you a few things, in the Incas, the Mayan, the Epic of Gilgamesh, in the Persian mythology, and certainly in the Greek mythology, which most of us as products of Western civilization are familiar with, also in India, Bolivia, South Sea Islands. Every one of these cultures, including the American Indians, every one of these cultures have legends of the star people. These people that came, these gods or demigods, whatever, came and cohabited with women and produced, a, produced hybrids. And the latter days, in part, will be distinguishable because of the rise of powers that have been suppressed or mm -hmm. repressed mm -hmm. over the years. But in the latter days, those powers will emerge once again. And one of our favorite verses uh, has to do with some, some of the words of Jesus in Matthew 24. Uh, starting in verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And what he's saying here is the days of Noah will be sort of transplanted into the latter day era. Mm -hmm. And you and I both believe we're seeing that absolutely, right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the um, in my opinion, we're looking at the return of the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. It's a different uh, incursion than what happened thousands and thousands of years ago. I believe I call it the, the coming great deception. And what we're going to see is, or what we are seeing, is this manifestation of orbs and craft and, and other phenomena, other anomalies. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, shows like the History Channel's Ancient Aliens yes. program is promulgating what I call the coming great deception. They're saying that E.T. created all life on this planet, that they genetically manipulated all life on this planet, that they started the world's civilizations and religions, and now are coming back at this critical juncture in human history. Well, Christians and the church better wake up to what is happening 
because this phenomena is real burgeoning and not going away. The Book of Enoch is one of many ancient texts which depict the Nephilim and their deeds. In 1947, a wandering shepherd stumbled on some writings hidden away in several caves near the Dead Sea. This collection, lost for nearly 2,000 years, became known throughout the world as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Included in the scrolls is a hidden book lost for centuries which told about fallen angels, bloodthirsty giants, and a warning for all humanity. This book gives an alternative and fascinating description of creation and the demise of man. It is an ancient writing filled with dreams and visions, a tour of heaven and hell guided by the angel Uriel. The Book of Enoch is named for the man who the Holy Bible says walked with God. And Enoch walked with God after he begot Methuselah three hundred years, and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty-five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. Genesis chapter 5. The book of Enoch begins with the warning to all humanity. A divine judgment has been rendered and sentence will be imposed. God tells Enoch that all life on earth will be destroyed in a violent flood, and with a story in Genesis, God blames this evil on the sons of God, angels who lusted after the daughters of men. These angels are sometimes referred to as watchers. They keep constant watch. And they decide one day, about 200 of them, that they're going to descend to the earth. They would like to very much make contact with these mortal women. The Book of Enoch was an expanded story of the mysterious giants, the sons of God, and the daughters of the earth, spoken of in Genesis chapter 6. Anytime you read the book of Genesis, there are all kinds of unanswered questions. Suddenly, there is this quick few verses at the beginning of the flood story about giants in the land that come from the sons of God mixing with the daughters of the earth. And you stop and think, wait a minute, what's this all about? It's like it went by too fast. And you want to grab it and say, wait a minute, what was this? They taught them charms and enchantments, and they became pregnant and bared great giants whose height was 3,000 L's. When men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. Enoch chapter 7. That these angels have crossed over this boundary that they shouldn't have. They were spiritual beings and they were to remain as such. When they decided to descend upon earth, this unleashed upon the earth all sorts of problems. Not only these giants who are bloodthirsty and violent, but also these angels went on to teach humankind a variety of forbidden crafts. They also taught human beings how to make weapons of war. Now the good angels, the ones not tempted by these beautiful women, go to God and say, you know, there's a lot of bloodshed caused by these bad angels. At which point God says, we need to bind Azael, the sort of lead fallen angel, to bind him and to then cast him into a pit. We might think of this as how do we take care of nuclear waste in the 21st century? You take it out to a part of the world where no one lives, and you bury it as deep as you can. For this community, the angel was like that sort of nuclear waste. Dangerous, volatile. After the rebel angels are cast into the depths of the earth, Enoch has a dream vision. The lead angel, Azael, begged Enoch to plead their case before God to petition them and release them from the depths of the earth. The request for clemency is denied. And now, the giants, who are produced from the spirits and flesh, shall be called evil spirits upon the earth, and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies. Because they are born from men, and from the holy watchers, their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on earth and evil spirits shall they be called. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their place, but as for the spirits of the earth, 
which were born upon the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. They take no food, but still hunger and thirst, and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women, because they have proceeded from them. The Book of Enoch, Chapter 15 verses 8 through 12. Enoch tells us an expatiated story of creation and the depravity of the watchers, or fallen angels, who created bastard children of gigantic stature, with an intense evil nature. Their strength was prodigious and their appetites immense. Upon devouring all of humankind's resources, they started to consume humans themselves. The Nephilim attacked and oppressed humans and were the cause of massive destruction on Earth. Enoch also wrote another book from the Dead Sea Scrolls called The Book of Giants. Only broken fragments remain from the original scroll. It tells more about the corrupt nature of the Nephilim and how they created all kinds of monsters, altering the DNA of animals and man. Enoch says their imagination was the only limit. It is my belief Enoch is explaining the dinosaurs and the bizarre skeletons which archaeologists have found. They were a part of the abomination which provoked God to terminate all living creatures. Modern science is constantly endeavoring to classify the remains within some Darwinian theory. It would take more faith to believe in them than it does to believe in the Bible. Many creationists, without understanding the antediluvian world, try to force some defensive explanation which fits their theories. Some scholars believe there were select dinosaurs created by God based upon a behemoth description in the book of Job, chapter 40, verses 14 through 24. They insist there is evidence of these creatures after the flood, but it's only conjecture. However, many of my own theories are conjecture as well. It makes sense that dinosaurs are related to birds when you accept the idea of the Nephilim crossbreeding the birds and animals. If you crossbreed a crocodile with a giraffe or an elephant, you can imagine what it would look like. All modern scientists agree the dinosaurs were destroyed at the same time by some cataclysmic event. Couldn't this event be a global flood? Some scientists say the sea life found in the Himalayas and other major mountain ranges is due to the fact that they were once seabeds. Is it possible the sea fossils found were deposited by a global flood? God destroyed the world because everything was corrupt except for a few righteous people. I find it interesting that the science of today is again altering the gene pool under the guise of improving humanity. Are we back to creating monsters? Is it a sign of the end of days? Jesus said the end of days would be like the days of Noah, and the altering of DNA certainly qualifies us with the time of Noah. The Nephilim on the earth in those days, other translations say the word giants, uh, which is somewhat of a, I mean they were big, but that, they weren't called giants because they were big. They were called uh, Gegenes, or they were called Nephilim, because they were fallen ones, and they were the progeny of fallen angels and women. And what's so interesting is that every ancient commentary, uh, whether it's Philo, Josephus, the, uh, the Book of the Giants, uh, the Genesis Apocryphon, uh, if you look at the, the Aramaic Targumim, all of these are saying that that very thing, that it was angels, fallen angels that came down and took women and they created this hybrid race. So Satan was trying to destroy the seed, but God, of course, preserved the seed so that when Mary uh, came on the scene, then the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and placed the other half of uh, the needed seed in there so that it was through Mary's seed, through her gamete, her 23 chromosomes, and the combination of the Holy Spirit giving 23 chromosomes, which would then produce the zygote into which the Lord Jesus you know, be was incarnated into. Man can now peer into a single cell organism, transplant DNA, research deep space, and create computers capable of processing a million bits of data in just nanoseconds. All of our achievement and technology has done nothing to promote our morality. We can be a very corrupt and arrogant people. The Bible's narrative of sin has been the best explanation I have experienced. It brings to light the dark nature hiding in all of us. 
the good news is the Bible provides a way to overcome. God's love for the world is expressed in the sacrifice of His only Son, and whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. And Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And Jehovah God planted a garden eastward, in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. Genesis chapter 2 verses 7 and 8. The Bible tells us the Garden of Eden was the intended habitat for man. Because of the original sin of Adam and Eve, they were cast out. This story is known throughout the world, but the story is told in Genesis chapter 6 is only known by a few. Now they have to survive in a hostile environment. Little did they know how hostile it would become. The reign of the Nephilim started around the time of the patriarch Jared, the sixth generation from Adam. The very angels entrusted to help man now conspired against him. The angel Satan was always incensed and jealous of Adam and refused to pay him homage. Now a group of conspiring angels mated with earthly women, and these women bore the Nephilim. God's creation became an abomination. As we have already heard, these giants were bloodthirsty and made themselves to be gods. The Book of Giants, written by Enoch, reveals part of the story and elaborates on the exploits of the giants, especially the two children of Shimihazo, Oya and Heya. Since no complete manuscript exists of the giants, the exact contents and order remain a matter of guesswork. Most of the content of the present fragments concerns the giants' ominous dreams and Enoch's efforts to interpret them and to intercede with God on the giants' behalf. The Book of Giants, like the Book of Enoch, tells us how the Nephilim altered the DNA of animals and man, creating all sorts of monsters. The Greek myths of the Minotaur, Satyr, and Centaur take on new and more realistic perspective. There are scholars who now believe the dinosaurs are the result of this genetic manipulation. I believe it to be the best explanation of all the theories I've considered. There are many aspects of the dinosaurs that just do not fit into the scheme of this world. As I already mentioned, some scholars believe certain dinosaurs were created by God, based on the verses in the book of Job. I admit it's possible, but I'm still not convinced. We now have an overall picture of the time period. Since the time of Jared, the sixth generation from Adam, humans and animals were now subjected to the will of the fallen angels, the Nephilim giants, and their hybrid monsters. There is new evidence indicating that man was indeed walking with dinosaurs. This entire century, we've been told that dinosaurs existed millions of years ago and became extinct before the arrival of man. I find these theories, which are based on Darwin's theory of evolution, absurd and shameful. Scientists and educators have gone to great lengths to keep out the creation story from schools throughout the United States. The public educational system's use of separation of church and state is exactly what our forefathers were trying to prevent, governmental dictation. It was never intended to separate God from government. The founders wanted to preclude what they experienced in Britain, where the government created a single domination to the exclusion of all others. There is corruption in our educational system's agenda and their selected scientific methods. In the end, they did not keep out religion in schools. They replaced Christianity with their own substitute, the theory of evolution. That's right, the theory of evolution is indeed a religion with man in charge of his own destiny. Most scientists are now concluding that Darwin's theory does not stand up to modern biological standards. Now that we are able to see and understand the complexity of a single cell organism, which Darwin could not, we know he was wrong. There is a petition signed by 600 professors from the top universities throughout the United States to stop teaching Darwin's theories. In century when Darwin was alive, uh, scientists thought that the basis of life, the cell, was some simple glob of protoplasm, like a little piece of jello or something that was not hard to explain at all. But with the hard work of science in the 20th century, we've seen that the, the cell is far from simple. It's, it's got 
very complicated molecular machines and things that are very resistant to Darwinian explanation. Scientists will tell you if evidence is contaminated, then carbon dating will be wildly inaccurate. If you accept the flood theory, then everything was underwater for a year. There is no doubt the evidence before the flood is contaminated. This leaves us with no accurate date. However, there is evidence of man walking with dinosaurs. My reaction was one of shock. I had heard of human footprints being found in this locale uh, on the Paluxy near Glen Rose, Texas, but I was rather skeptical. And uh, here, after removing actual rock layers, the team and I excavated a series of dinosaur footprints. And 18 and one half inches from one of those dinosaur footprints, we excavated a 16 inch human footprint. We excavated 12 footprints in a series. And when you find a trail with left, right, left, right pace and stride, the right distance apart, then you have to interpret this as belonging to uh, humankind. We found trails leading under limestone ledges and actually removed the limestone ledges one slab of rock at a time. And we found that both the dinosaur footprint and the trail of human footprints continued under the rock ledges. This evidence is real. I first saw the Burdick print on my initial visit to Glen Rose in 1984. My impression at that time was that it was too perfect. But it's clearly a human footprint demonstrating the heel section, the arch, the base of the metatarsals, the first or great toe, second, third, fourth, and fifth toe. After our examination of this print, we find that it definitely is in the Cretaceous uh, limestone in the same formation with the dinosaur footprints. Here we're looking at a cross section and we can see very obvious following contours under the great toe and actually structures under each one where we see the calcite inclusion, the force was concentrated and produced these load-bearing structures which are exactly what geologists look for. We have eliminated uh, the idea that it's carved. It definitely is original impression in the sediment. This is said to be a fossilized finger of a human being. It was found in the same strata as the dinosaur tracks. It had what appeared to be a nail, what appeared to be a cuticle, a taper, a humanoid shape. After I saw the CAT scan, there was no longer any room in my mind for doubt. This scan shows the shape of the finger. It shows tissue beneath the skin of the finger. It shows the bone. It shows the joints. It shows a ligament. That tells me this is a human finger. Uh, as I said, over the past 150 years, uh, these archaeologists and anthropologists have covered up as much evidence as they've dug up, literally. Basically what you find is uh, something we call a knowledge filter. This is a fundamental feature of science. It's also a fundamental feature of human nature. People tend to filter out things that don't fit, that don't make sense in terms of their paradigm or their way of thinking. So in science you find that evidence that doesn't fit the accepted paradigm tends to be eliminated. It's not taught, it's not discussed, and people who are educated in, in scientific teachings generally don't even learn about it. Carbon dating can be highly inaccurate for dating archaeological artifacts. It's not just that it can be inaccurate, it's worse than that. There are numerous cases in the past where items have been carbon dated and found outrageously wrong. Does carbon dating work at all? Despite its problems, the underlying ideas are sound and scientists are pursuing the reasons why carbon dating can be so inaccurate. There are reasons for the problems. The first one is contamination. If an archaeological artifact is contaminated, then you have no scientific method to calculate it. Another reason is the level of carbon in the atmosphere at the time. It's my personal belief one of the ways life was reduced in years and size was the altering of the atmosphere by the hand of God. 
So the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14 before the flood was completely different. There are many details which scientists presume were taking place. They are only guessing. Many scientists give off an illusion of knowledge as if it were true. If you say something long and loud enough, society will accept it. Do not believe this illusion. Carbon dating has a 10,000 year limit. Anything after that can be highly inaccurate. The Great Flood covered the Earth for an entire year and contaminated everything. It's my belief the flood took place approximately 12,000 years ago, what historians refer to as the end of the Ice Age. It seems appropriate that carbon dating would only be accurate until the time of the flood. Is there evidence of giants on Earth? The subject of giants is probably not for everyone. It seems to be a subject for certain scholars and a few believers. There is also a mysterious spiritual principle involved. This is probably why most people do not understand, perhaps for hidden reasons. Just like a psychological puzzle, you must develop the right perspective to understand it, or it looks like foolishness. My research is based on faith in the Bible, a core of truth in early Jewish writings, other ancient texts, and existing archaeological artifacts. The ancient cultures of our distant past were not simple-minded, as we have been led to believe. They were highly intelligent in mathematics, physics, engineering, and astronomy. Where did this information come from? The following clips are about a few ancient sites and their myths. According to ancient Chinese legend, over 100 pyramids discovered in China are the legacy of extraterrestrial visitors. When local villagers were asked about the pyramids, they said the ancient giants constructed them. When they questioned a custodian of a local monastery, they were told, according to records housed in the monastery, the pyramids were said to be at least 5,000 years old. One can only guess at their real age. Did the antediluvian giants build these pyramids, or was it the post-flood giants? They said the pyramids belonged to the old emperors who reigned in China, and the emperors always stressed the fact that they were not from Earth. Rather, they were descendants of the sons of heaven who roared down to this planet on their fiery dragons. It is interesting the custodian used the phrase, sons of heaven. This is the terminology of Genesis chapter 6 verse 4. These pyramids tell us about the presence of giants on earth, whose fathers were the sons of heaven. These pyramids were aligned astronomically, and this astronomy was common in other structures throughout the world. Teotihuacan, the city of the gods, is just south of Mexico City. The largest pyramids are the pyramids of the sun and moon. They were said to be built by an early race of giants from the first world. After the completion of the pyramids, these giants turn into gods. According to Aztec myth, all of the gods sacrificed themselves for mankind. This causes the government to be established and the birth of the Aztec civilization. Once again, we see pyramids built by giants who considered themselves to be gods. These gods instructed the people to sacrifice humans to please them. The early Jewish writings expound upon the Genesis verses and describe many more details about the cannibalistic Nephilim, and we can see their bloodthirsty traits carried out here. These pyramids, like those in China, were built by giants and had astronomical implications. As a matter of fact, this whole complex is a reflection of our solar system. Were the Nephilim trying to duplicate the Giza Plateau? In my books, The Middle of the Earth and the Messianic Temple, I present my evidence concerning the Giza Plateau in Egypt. I concluded the Giza Plateau is the middle of the Earth as described in early Jewish writings. It was intended as a witness and sign for the one true God. Through the ancient historian Josephus, I explained the Great Pyramid as one of the pillars of Seth, which was to be an astronomical record for all future generations, including us. The Nephilim were perverting all of God's creation and were attempting to replace God. We see that plan being carried out here at Teotihuacan. The city represents astronomical pyramids, temples with bloodthirsty sacrifices, and was built by giants.
In Mayan mythology, a group of four protective deities, the sons of Itzamna and Ixl, are giants who uphold the sky at its cardinal points. Just like Teotihuacan, these giants built the original pyramids as astronomical observatories. It is well known today the calendar of the Mayans is more accurate than our own. They understood the concepts of pi and zero. It is even thought they had a representation of a black hole called the Dark Rift. Their understanding and knowledge reflected that of the Nephilim. The Nephilim were part angel and had a knowledge far superior than man's. These gods also instructed the people in bloody sacrifices. Even their games depict the dark path set for the Mayans. The image of a priest cutting the still beating heart from a man probably delighted the Nephilim. We can only imagine their intoxicated and wicked laughter. The Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants tell how they devoured man in the worst way. They also created genetically altered bees to help them in this quest. They were bound and determined to pervert all of creation. These temples tell us of their astronomical knowledge and their reprehensible past. The Maya were still communicating with the fallen angels who were cast under the earth and the Nephilim spirits in an alternate dimension. The Maya priests would alter their state of mind with hallucinatory drugs and spoke directly to the gods of the underworld. Even though the angels were already judged and doomed in the underworld, they were still communicating with those who would listen. Although the bodies of the Nephilim were destroyed, their spirits still preached to the Mayans and all other Mesoamericans. Many researchers believe the ruins of Tiwanaku, situated only 12 miles south of Lake Titicaca, is the oldest city ever discovered on Earth. Consistent with these theories, the Inca living in the region during the Spanish conquest explained that Tiwanaku had existed for thousands of years before their civilization began. According to Inca legend, Lake Titicaca was revered as the location where the god Viracocha created a race of giants and later the first humans. The Inca maintained that the giants built Tiwanaku and also many other cities and structures in the area. However, due to their great evil, Viracocha destroyed the giants in a world flood. This legend is still believed by the local Indians to this day. The facing stones of this site are perfectly set with no mortar. We took a needle, and that needle we tried to insert at every point along the joint, and the needle couldn't be inserted. A perfect cut. Now the ancients constructed the site with astronomical alignments in mind. As the sun rises each day, it moves along the horizon, and arises in a different spot. To measure this movement, they built the temple itself as a giant clock to tell them how the progression of the sun was proceeding. And we can use those same astronomical alignments to date the site. The antiquity and the technological sophistication of Tiwanaku should make each and every one of us fully question the origins of civilization. Giants also figure in the mythology of Stonehenge, one of the most famous structures in the world. These massive standing stones were called the Giant's Dance by the earliest inhabitants, and they believe giants constructed it. Stonehenge is an astronomical observatory, mapping the solstices and the equinoxes. It is also believed to be a place of sacrifice. Who actually built Stonehenge and how they did it are enduring mysteries. Do these legends contain a core of truth? Was it built by giants? The spiral-shaped Gilga Rafaim is located 20 miles from the Sea of Galilee. Constructed of an estimated 40,000 tons of loose rock, it is remarkably reminiscent of Stonehenge. 
Both of these megalithic structures are considered astronomical observatories, and both were said to have been built by giants. However, in Gilgal Raphaim, there is biblical evidence. Israeli archaeologist Daniel Herman is investigating a newly opened grave. This is a tomb of someone, obviously, a very powerful man. Look at the size of the stone slabs used. This must have taken an enormous amount of time and effort to construct. When the Israelites came here and wrote their Bible, it was already here. They saw it. So they have documented the identification of the site by saying that this region was ruled by Og, king of the Bashan. Og is described in the Book of Deuteronomy as, and I quote, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the Rephaim. Rephaim is Hebrew word for giant. Did you know Sudan has more pyramids than Egypt? These are obviously man-made pyramids and temples, which included human sacrifices in the attempt to carry on the Nephilim tradition. The knowledge of giants and their sacrifices were translated beyond the Great Flood. The local stories of giants in Sudan are similar to the early Jewish writings in Genesis, such as this legend. There was war among the giants and they were very evil. They killed many people for their resources and many great warriors died at their hand. One day the Lord decided the giants were the cause of the world being unbalanced and full of hurt and pain. The Lord called the chief of the giants and told them it was time for all giants to leave the world. Archaeologists have unearthed an ancient tomb in northern Sudan, which they believe confirms the location of Africa's oldest human sacrifice. Also found were relics indicating a knowledge of astronomy and astrology. Here again we see astronomical pyramids and human sacrifice, passing on the tradition of the giant Nephilim. Are these megaliths and legends telling the same story? They all point to an ancient civilization more than 12,000 years ago. They tell of giants, human sacrifice, and astronomy. I am convinced there is a thread of truth running through these places and legends and is woven into the Genesis chapter 6 narrative, early Jewish writings, and many ancient texts. These structures and legends are spread over the entire earth. They are duplicates of the Giza Plateau the original pyramid of Seth, intended to be a sign and witness of the one true God. The Nephilim knew of the coming flood and wanted to pass their legacy, just like the pyramid of Seth. All of these legends tell of a great flood destroying man, except for a few who survived in a boat and repopulated the world. Mass graves of giants were opened, some of them some of the men eight feet tall, some of the women seven feet tall, uh, some records of men ten feet tall, and extremely large skulls. And extraordinarily, uh, some of these skulls had horns, some had extra rows of teeth, uh, some had other what we would call anomalies, but they were extraordinarily large skulls and uh, extraordinarily large people. A number of Mounds in the Midwest, in America, were excavated uh, starting in around 1850. And in many cases, they would find skeletons of people who were in excess of seven feet tall. And in many cases, they had double rows of teeth, as well as, in some cases, six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. The one that was found in uh, Bridal Vale Falls, California by a group of miners, first they found this wall with very intricate hieroglyphics. They assumed that they were finding gold behind the wall. They broke it down and they found this woman holding a child covered with fur and a strange kind of dust. The same tall female mummified remains have been found in Texas. They have been found in Death Valley. They have been found in other parts of California. 
Archaeology at that time was in a heyday. There was everybody that had a shovel was out trying to find something. But what's interesting is, is that the finding of these giant mummified bodies and giant fossils and bones, uh, really you can't pinned to any particular location. They were finding them in Greece, they were finding them in Italy, they were finding them in the Middle East, they were finding them in America. And even if you write off a few of those as perhaps a hoax or a misinterpretation of something else, uh, you're still left with a tremendous amount of evidence to show that there were these giant beings at some point uh, walking the earth. They began excavating the 10 to 15 feet of guano that was here in this cave. They started discovering some unusual artifacts. They found duck decoys and baskets, other things for hunting and fishing in the nearby lake that's now drying up. But then they made some very unusual discoveries, and those were of red-haired giants that were mummified. These giants were six and a half to seven feet tall. In many cases, they were mummified, wrapped up like Egyptian mummies, and they had long red hair going down to their shoulders. The ranchers couldn't explain it. It was the strangest thing they'd ever seen. But the Paiute Indians who lived around here knew all about it. In fact, back in 1883, Sarah Winnemucca, a Paiute Indian princess, had written a book called Life Among the Paiutes. In that book, she talked all about the giant red-haired people who used to live around this lake and live in this cave. She claimed they were cannibals. That tribe would eat the dead. They would make war on my people. My people went to work and gathered wood to fill up the mouth of the cave. At last, my people set it on fire and called out to them, give up or you will die. But no answer came. I think the world looked like the cities we see in Machu Picchu, Tiahuanaco, Sashe Human. I think it was a world peopled by giants who structured their buildings out of massive building blocks, 500 ton, 250 ton blocks. <laughs> The architects are that race or those races who built all the megaliths in uh, the old world, the pyramid, Stonehenge. Uh, they are the people who walked before us, the ones who inhabited this world before we did. Uh, we have called them gods. We have sometimes called them giants. Uh, they left their handiwork behind, and we have not been able to duplicate it. We've only reached the point now where we can really appreciate it. In Lebanon, 44 miles from Beirut, are the imposing ruins of Baalbek. There is mention of this place in the Old Testament, the Book of Kings. Baalbek in particular is a very good example. That has the trilophon. Those are the largest stones in the world ever used for construction. They're so large we don't even know their actual weight. Now, those stones were somehow quarried, moved five miles, lifted 25, 30 feet in the air, and placed together so closely that you can't fit a razor blade or a piece of paper in between them. We have no idea how they did it. We don't have a crane in the world that can lift weights anywhere near what those things are. According to Arab tradition, the earliest temples here were created after the flood by a tribe of giants for the biblical king, Nimrod. It seems quite clear because of the references in Genesis and later on the book of Numbers and also in, in Deuteronomy, which are all fairly consistent with each other, that there were gigantic beings that seem to stem from pre-flood era. The conclusion in the tradition seems to be fairly clear that, that gigantic beings were existing at one time and that as human history developed or as phys physiological, uh, emotional, spiritual changes took place, the, those beings who survived seemed to be of a smaller gene pool but the possibility that there were other strands of humanity, as it were, seems to be uh, almost explicitly stated in, in the Bible itself. In the book of Numbers, we are told, after wandering in the desert with his people, Moses sent out scouts for a place they could settle. 
the scouts went north to Hebron. On their return, they reported, all the people we saw there are men of gigantic size. We felt no bigger than grasshoppers, and that is how we looked to them. If we look at scripture, there were giants in the earth in those days. And if we take that literally, rather than symbolically, that there were simply men of great powers and extraordinary abilities, then we could say that the first men, the first humans, were giants. Or we could theorize that these giants came from somewhere else and used Earth as a colony. This colony was the conception of the Nephilim. It was their fathers, the fallen angels, who came down from heaven and introduced earthly women to a new strand of DNA, creating all sorts of monstrous beings. There were giants in those days, and also after that.